Hi. Today we're going to talk about spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy, a nanoimaging technique that allows us to image magnetic domains. My name is Oliver Dewey. I'm a graduate student at Rice University, and this video was made in fulfillment of the final requirements for ELEC 571. Today is December 11th, 2017. I hope you enjoy the show. As you might imagine, I'm a scientist. This means that I like to observe the world to see what I can learn about the world around us. Some scientists look at things that are very, very big, like a planet with a moon rotating around it. Others, like myself, like to look at things that are very small, perhaps like a honeycomb and a beehive. If you want to look at very, very big objects, you might get yourself a telescope. And if you're interested in studying small objects, we tend to turn to microscopes. But what if we want to look at something even smaller, perhaps a honeycomb made of carbon atoms, which is the system that I'm, in particular, very interested in. As your system gets smaller, you run into issues when trying to use light microscopy. Consider two point objects a certain distance apart. If you shine light of a certain wavelength on it, you're not going to be able to tell that they're distinct objects if the spacing is less than about half the wavelength. This is called the diffraction limit. There's several ways around this. For instance, we use electron microscopy, which decreases the wavelength, in improving resolution, near-field microscopy, which uses entirely different mechanisms, or new techniques, which are emerging all the time. Today we're going to focus on a near-field microscopy technique. One broad class of near-field techniques is called scanning probe microscopy. The easiest way to think of SPM is to consider a record player needle. If you drag a fine tip needle over the surface of an object, you can use certain methods to determine what the shape of that surface looks like. In this case, if you do this at a very, very small scale and you do it again and again and over a certain area, you can form an image. The two main techniques are atomic force microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy. We're going to talk briefly about scanning tunneling microscopy itself. Rather than making physical contact with the sample as you might uh, on your record player or an AFM, you bring the tip very, very close to the sample and then apply a voltage difference across the two. At the atomic level, you'll get a tunneling current if you're close enough between the sample and the tip. In order to get an image, you need a feedback loop that looks at that tunneling current and maintains the height of the probe over the sample at a certain distance to either keep the current constant or the height above the sample constant. There's another great video on this channel about STM, so I suggest you turn there if you're interested. Today we're going to focus instead on how we use STM to get magnetic information instead of just height information out of a sample. In order to understand this, we're going to introduce the concept of a spin valve. Much like a valve that controls the flow of fluid, a spin valve is a concept that controls the flow of current, or electrons. This valve works because of a phenomena called tunnel magneto resistance. TMR. TMR results from the conservation of electron spin. If you have two ferromagnets close enough to induce a tunneling current, but their spins are opposite, the tunneling current will be reduced uh, proportional to the polarization difference. However, if you have two ferromagnets that are polarized the same way, then you'll be able to get a much larger tunneling current. SPSTM leverages this effect to image magnetic domains. So how do we implement this in an STM? Well, first we start by choosing a magnetic tip with a certain polarization. Then by scanning the probe over the surface of your sample as normal, inducing a voltage difference, you can measure the change in current dependent upon the magnetic domains. But now you have height information and magnetism information feeding into the feedback loop. How do you tell them apart? We're going to have to find a way to decouple these signals. Otherwise, you're just going to have a crazy mix of information and not know which is which. Perhaps the simplest method to solve this problem is simply actually doing nothing. Turns out, if you operate in normal constant current mode, the signal from the change in magnetism will almost entirely dwarf the signal from the change in height, meaning that you will basically only be imaging the magnetic domains. This is really great if you have a really fat, flat sample. However, if you have a very bumpy sample or a very large sample, you could lead yourself into a tip crash because you're not controlling for the actual height. So if you don't have a perfectly flat or small sample, you might consider using method two, which is called spin-resolved spectroscopic mode. In this mode, you basically operate the STM as a regular STM at every point, and then also as a magnetic STM at every point by modulating the potential. You scan normally using a regular uh, constant voltage, 
and then at each point you switch off the feedback loop that controls the height and then modulate the potential at every point and operate in a constant height mode. Finally, you can use a mode called modulated tip magnetization. In this mode, you wrap a coil around the STM tip, allowing you to in induce electromagnetic behavior in the tip. By modulating this electromagnetic behavior very quickly, you can switch the polarization of your tip back and forth, either in an in-plane or out-of-plane configuration, shown here in these two images. If you modulate this quicker than the height feedback loop can respond, you'll be able to tease out the magnetic information separate from the height information without inducing tip crashes. So how do we pick a tip when performing SPSTM? There are several different magnetic materials, and that material choice is what's most important. You can choose a ferromagnet or an anti-ferromagnet, and this is an important option. Also, you want to know if you're picking a bulk material or a thin film material on top of a non-magnetic material. Finally, your choice of polarization, again, whether it's in-plane or out-of-plane, can give you different information depending on what you're imaging. Start by looking at the choice between ferromagnets or anti-ferromagnets. If we consider the atomic point of the tip, mm, too small, let me try again. If you consider the point of the tip where there's just a single atom doing the current, if you have a ferromagnet and all of them are polarized the same way, as you move that tip across the surface of the sample, you can induce stray fields, which will actually change the magnetization of the sample. This tends to mean that anti-ferromagnetic tips are more uh, desirable because only the tip itself sets the polarization and you don't get these straight fields. Finally, polarization angle is very important. If you choose a out-of-plane polarization, you might be able to image your magnetic domain themselves. However, if you choose an in-plane polarization, there's really interesting behavior at the side walls of these domains that you can image. and You can understand what the walls of these magnetic domains look like. So you'll get entirely different information, both completely valid, just by choosing a different tip. This makes SPSTM a very powerful technique, particularly in magnetic uh, systems. In summary, spin polarized scanning tunneling microscopy is a powerful near field technique that allows you to avoid the diffraction limit. It can be powerful, flexible, and fun. Thank you for your time.